Greetings and welcome to In-Depth. I'm DK Ronstam. The Ministry of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries is continuing a sensitization campaign on rabies in Trinidad and Tobago. So we're very happy to be joined by Acting Chief Veterinary Officer, Dr. Lisa Musai. Welcome, Dr. Musai. Thank you so much for making the time. I want us to start off by getting an idea of what is rabies and how prevalent is it in Trinidad and Tobago? Sure. Thank you for having me. Rabies is a severe, deadly viral infection that affects animals and humans, so mammals in general. It is a zoonotic disease, meaning that humans can get it from animals. And in Trinidad in particular, this disease is spread mainly by vampire bats. So when a vampire bat bites an animal or a human, the virus is, is transferred from the bat through the infected saliva into the bite wound, and then that animal or person is now infected. And the virus then travels to the nerves, the spinal cord, the brain, and you get a lot of nervous systems. Um, nervous system clinical signs, and it also goes to the salivary glands. So you would see that animals succumb into a lot of drooling and hypersalivation. And well, generally, rabies manifests itself into two different clinical ways. One is a furious form, and that's the form that is spread mainly by dogs. And that disease is manifested as aggressive behavior, hyperactive behavior, hypersensitive behavior as well. We don't have that in Trinidad, and we have not seen that in Trinidad for, over, for about 108 years, and we'd like to keep it that way. The, the type that we see in Trinidad is the paralytic form, and this is the form that is spread by the vampire bats, and it affects mainly livestock. So your cattle, your sheep and goats, are the animals that are mainly affected. And it manifests itself as a ascending paralysis. So you get animals exhibiting signs such as weakness in their legs, they're unable to stand, they're unable to walk, they're paralyzed. There's difficulty in swallowing, difficulty in breathing. Um, you get fever, depression. There's also a fear of water. So the animal will refuse to drink or go, anywhere, go near water. So, um, when you see those signs as a farmer or a, an animal owner, you want to not put your hands near the mouth of the animal because, as I mentioned before, it is spread by infected saliva. It can well, also- Dr. Musai, in terms, in terms of that, and, and I'm glad you raised that point, not to, because yes. I can see- the the opportunity or the potential for a farmer, a small ruminant farmer, especially who has someone who has had the experience of an animal choking, saying, okay, well, this animal is choking. How does that look different from what it is you're saying with regard to an animal who is suffering from rabies? Okay, so the animal will look like it's choking. It's choking. Um, but you would see the other signs, not able to stand up. The animal would be lying down you know, uh, um, on its side, you would see um, nervous, other nervous signs that making you think, well, okay, I should be a little more cautious. This animal isn't just choking. And if you see those signs, what we recommend is that you call us, right? Um, you can contact us at the anti rabies unit, or you can contact your county veterinary officer. We have a county veterinary office at every county in the country. So contact us and we would be the ones who would come in and investigate the situation and assist as much as we can. Now, if by chance that farmer um, did attempt to assist that animal and has come into contact with infected saliva on his hands, especially if the farmer has cuts or wounds on his hands, it's going to then you know you're going to get a, a quicker um, rate of infection of the virus that way. So what we recommend that you do immediately 
is wash that area, wash your hands, wash the area with soap and water for at least 15 minutes. That's very, very important. And you can, you know, rid the virus as, you know, as simply and as easily as just performing that activity. But having also done that, you also need to contact the veterinary public health because they need to come in and do an assessment and make sure that you're okay otherwise and to determine if it is that you need further treatment. Because the thing with rabies is that if you get infected, it is 100% fatal, practically. Meaning if you get infected, you will die. But it is also 100% preventable. Meaning Explain that, that to me. Yes. So Explain that to me. That, and and, and, and one, one of the reasons I asked you to do that is because once again, I go back to the uh, the situation. Okay, well, this animal choking. Let me see if I can dislodge something. And then, okay, yes. you find out, okay, well, there wasn't anything in the passageway. And we just heard Dr. Musai talk about rabies. So I'm calling and I'm washing my hands or whatever pass for that 20, for that 15 minutes. But is it a matter of, is it in my bloodstream? How infectious is it? How fast does it travel? So you say it's 100% fatal, but it's 100% uh, preventable. So break that down for me, please. Okay. So if you get infected and you do nothing for 24 hours and you have not been previously protected from the virus by vaccination and the persons who would be vaccinated are the ones who are high at risk. So it would be the vets. It would be pe people working in the rabies labs, people who frequent caves and work with bats. So those are the people who normally, you know, take in front and would vaccinate themselves before they deal with a rabid animal or deal with rabies in a lab. So if you're not one of those and you have not been vaccinated before and you do nothing for 24 hours, you will die. You speak, about that, vaccinations. You, 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 you speak about vaccinations, Dr. Musa. Right now, there's still some individuals, especially looking at where we are with regard to the pandemic and stuff, look at uh, vaccinations a little leery. Uh, how, how, how old or how old is the technology? How old are these vaccines for, for the rabies virus? And what are some of the things that you'd want to share to allay any concerns that an, an individual might have? Okay, so it does not mean that everyone has to be vaccinated. It's not like, you know, what we went through with the pandemic and that you ask the population to be vaccinated because the population is not as high risk as others, right? What we do ask is that if you suspect that you might have become infected, for instance, that scenario that you were describing with a farmer helping out an animal, what you need to do is contact the veterinary public health. They would come in and they would assess the situation. They would examine you and they will determine if you require what is called post-exposure prophylaxis, right? PEP. And if it is that they strongly suspect that you could have become infected, they will give you a series of um, injections for a period of time that will prevent you from succumbing to disease. So that is how it is 100% preventable, but you must act quickly. You have to do that within 24 hours. That's the key there. And I'm glad you say you give that time frame because I know sometimes someone may say, no, nah, man, well, some bush, I, I use that. And it, we see if, and if we have something that uh, is presenting a little more extreme than we think we can handle. Then we reach out to see if we can get some help. So I'm glad you give that time frame. But you also speak about who might be more in a dangerous position than others. So, but at the same token, where are the bats that you're talking about? Are bats in general dangerous? The vampire bats, the distinction that you make, are there certain areas that you'd find them other than in, in more proliferation than others? All right. So we have several different types of bats in the country, right? You have your vampire bats, and there are two types of vampire bats that we have in Trinidad, the common vampire bat and the white-winged vampire bat. And other than those, and, and both vampire bats, both types are the ones that can spread 
other than those, you have your insect eating um, bats and you have your fruit bats. The fruit bats and the insect eating bats are not the spreaders of the virus. So they're not spreaders of, of the rabies disease. And if they happen to be the ones that in and around your household, you have nothing to fear in terms of rabies, right? You would find the vampire bats living mostly in the forested areas. So farmers and persons living near forest edges are the ones that need to be a little more cautious. And hunters who have their pack of hunting dogs that go out in the forests and are amongst the, the roosts and caves of these bats, these vampire bats are the ones that also have to be cautious because hunting dogs in particular are at a higher risk of being bitten by a vampire bat because they're out there at night doing their hunting and, and the bats do tend to bite them as well. We've seen cases of that starting up in Trinidad. And that is something that I want to come back to after we come from this break. We're speaking with Acting Chief Veterinary Officer, Dr. Lisa Musai. We're talking about rabies in Trinidad and Tobago and uh, some of the things that we need to be aware of. Stay with us. we we'll return after this. Welcome back. We are talking about rabies in Trinidad and Tobago. Some of the things that the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries is telling us to be sensitive about. We're doing so with acting v Chief Veterinary Officer, Dr. Lisa Musai. And Dr. Musai, you spoke about seeing a few increases in terms of hunting dogs. Uh, is it specific areas? Uh, and what are you, what are some of those common denominators that you see? Okay. Um... We've seen it mostly in the northeastern area and the south area of Trinidad. Um, so what we recommend for those animals is that they should be vaccinated against rabies, those hunting dogs, right? Because they have now joined the list of species that are susceptible to vampire bat biting. It's no longer just the cattle, sheep, and goat. We've seen it now in some hunting dogs, and we recommend that those dogs be vaccinated for rabies. All right, and in terms of initiatives that the ministry is doing, the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, what are some of those? And because I know that there's a sensitization campaign, what are some of the things that have been ruled out during this period? Okay, so in the Ministry of Agriculture, what we also have been doing is vaccinating livestock. So we've vaccinate your cattle, sheep, and goat. We've done over 7,000 per year so far because we've investigated and found that over 5,000 of those animals have actually been bitten by vampire bats. Um, there has been an increase in vampire bat biting of these animals. And the reason for that is because there have been an increase in the population of vampire bats in the country. So one of the other main activities that the anti rabies unit in our ministry does is that we help control the population of vampire bats. So we carry out certain culling exercises during the night. It's called the night trapping activities where we go out and we trap the bats. We set up mist nets and they fly into the nets. We trap them, we put them in cages. We take them out one by one and we pace these bats with an anticoagulant piece. Um, we then release those bats back into the wild. So that bat, that vampire bat, will now return to its roost to its cave. And the natural social behavior of bats, you know, they all greet each other and, you know, and in doing so, they would spread that anticoagulant piece to about 40 other bats. That anticoagulant piece is poisonous to the bat. So when they spread it, then you're dealing with a, a culling of about 40 bats for every bat that we paced. And we've pasted probably about 500 bats so far for the year. So you're looking at about, you know, roughly at least 15,000 bats that would have, vampire bats that would have been affected by our culling activity so far. 
And once we keep the bat population at a reasonable level for vampire bats, we can keep the rabies infection, rabies disease at bay. So apart from vaccinating the animals that we deem the most susceptible species, we have been handling the vectors of the disease as well. But looking at that culinary exercise, Dr. Musai, are you able, when the bats are trapped, to look at them and say, okay, well, this is a, one of the two types of vampire bats, or this is an insect bat or a fruit bat, so you know which one you're putting the paste on? Yes, that definitely. We only paste the vampire bats. Um, there are subtle differences in each bat, and to the average person, you won't be able to tell the difference to them a bat is a bat. But the anti-rabies unit are specially trained to, to recognize the, the different species of bats we have in the country, and they know which ones to piece. So what if we inadvertently catch a, a fruit bat or an insect-eating bat, they will just be released. They would be Very insect. glad to know, very glad to know, in terms of like those natural pollinators and, and, and ones that are helping to call the insect population or yes, manage they, them. They do prefer they do provide a very important role in, in our ecology and maintenance of our forests. So we want to keep them there as well. But you speak about the fact that rabies is spread through saliva. Uh, what is, is there any message you'd have for someone who say, well, if it's spread through the saliva and I think my animal has rabies, I just do, I just, I cut, I cut off the head and deal with the rest of meat. How, does that affect? Is 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 there is there something that you want to say about that? I want to say, don't do that. Um, you do not want to handle that animal before death or even after death until you contact us, right? Um, cutting off the head. Remember, I said that it travels through the nervous system, so it's also in the nerves, it's in the brain, it's in the spinal cord. You do not want to handle an animal. That, that could be infected because you can inadvertently, quite apart from dealing with the salivary glands and the mouth, infect yourself from dealing with other aspects of the carcass. So you do not want to do that. We would come and visit a suspect case and we would recommend how that animal or carcass should be handled. And with that in mind, and the two minutes that we have more, Dr. Musai, members of the public, how do they help in this exercise? How, what measures would you like us to adopt to make sure that rabies is something that is controlled and mitigated as much as possible? Okay, um, so contact us. If you have complaints of bat biting of your animals, let us know, we would come and investigate. And in our investigation, we would vaccinate the animals of that premises, of those premises and also surrounding areas. So in doing that, whatever bats might be in that area, those animals that are affected by the bats and vampire bats in those areas would be protected against the disease. So it prevents the spread of it, the disease. So contact us if you have um, complaints of bat biting and also contact us if you suspect your animal may be uh, an animal that has succumbed to rabies. So call us and let us come in and, and assist with that. We also give um, help the public and give advice in how to bat proof your homes and you know public buildings and so on. So if you require our assistance in that, the anti rabies unit would be more than happy to help give some advice on how to go about doing that as well. And just before we close, Dr. Musa, you spoke about, I think it's Northeast and South, uh, but in yes, terms of are, populations of vampire are, yes. bats. But we didn't speci I didn't specifically ask about Tobago. Tobago, Tobago remains vampire bat free and rabies free. Very nice. And I, I cut you off from saying something. So please finish that point. No, I was just saying that um, we over the years, um, we found that the hotspots in, in Trinidad has been in the Northeast and in the South when it comes to rabies and vampire bats. So we tend to target and focus our efforts mainly in those areas with vaccination of animals. All right. So we want to thank you so much, Dr. Lisa Musai, Acting Chief Veterinary Officer. And uh, 
some very important information and i think that number would have been 6932910 and we're sharing that as well for you to get more information directly from the individuals in the know and on behalf of the entire ttt news team i'm dk roster this has been in depth with me thank you so much for joining us <laughs>